and I have uh, with me on the panel two CEOs of wonderful entrepreneurial companies that I'll, I'll let uh, introduce themselves, but they've got uh, great stories to tell and I think also uh, uh, a lot of information to share about uh, thinking about when venture capital makes sense, when venture capital doesn't make sense, the process of evolving and growing a business as well as the process of, um, of uh, raising money and, and what are some of the ways to make sure that you tee yourself up for success when you're in that environment. So uh, let me uh, uh, introduce Matthew Monahan, who's the CEO of Inflection. Uh, which is a leading people search company that he can describe in, 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 a, in a bit more detail. And Terry Austin, who's the CEO of Guardian Analytics, which is a uh, anti-fraud solution for the online banking industry. I happen to be uh, a board member at, at both companies, but they were the best two companies that, uh, <laughs> that, that, that I could find. I'm thrilled to be involved with them both. And I think it also is helpful that one is more in the consumer internet space and one in the uh, SaaS enterprise focus space. Um, so, uh, Matthew, do you want to talk uh, uh, first just a little bit about sure. a little bit about the company and, and about yourself, so whoever has got a little bit of context? Yeah. So, uh, I'd sold a business prior to this. It was a consumer-based ebooks business that was only about five people um, when we sold it, and then moved into Inflection. This was in 2006, and so I started it with my brother. He was at Harvard doing this from his dorm room. And essentially the thesis is that a lot of the public record system is moving online right now, and there's a ton of data being digitized and moving onto the internet that hasn't been effectively organized. And so we saw an opportunity here um, to build a platform to not only bring the data in, but then also package it for consumers through a variety of channels, whether it's the search engines or the social networks and so forth. So today we're up to about 100 employees. We um, have two main brands. The first is called archives.com, which is a family tree, family history website that allows you to search your ancestors. And the second is called peoplesmart.com, which is a search engine uh, for people. And the main goal there is how do you solve people search in a privacy friendly way? And then we have a bunch of other vertical brands that we are adding data and, uh, and rolling out, including an identity protection and employment screening. Um, we raised money in 2010, middle of 2010, so it took us about three and a half years before we decided to raise our Series A deal. And so up until that point, we bootstrapped the company. It's been profitable since we started, which is something that we're very focused on and very proud of. And, um, and it's a phenomenal team uh, of a bunch of great people, and we're just uh, over here on University Avenue. Great, that great background. And, I, and there's, a, there's a whole bunch there that I think is interesting and in our great, um, lessons in, in that process about starting a business, evolving a business, uh, coming up with a strategic framework for what's really a good business and a defensible business that, uh, that we can get into over time as well. So uh, uh, Terry, do you want to do the same thing? Just sure. talk a little bit about the company and about yourself so people have some broad context. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so I'm Terry Austin, I'm CEO of uh, Guardian Analytics. Um, I've been CEO for two years. Uh, the company's been around for about five and a half, almost six years. Um, so I joined later. Um, I joined after the company had done their A round, uh, kind of a seed followed by an A round, though we've labeled it differently. I'll just use that. Uh, and the um, company had a product. They had a version one product, and they had about six or seven customers using the product. So there were certain proof points that had been established. Um, and I've been there for about two years uh, and did a couple of transitions of the company. We're now on version four of the product, so we've introduced some, some pretty significant revs. And the most recent one was to move to a SaaS architecture to deliver this product in a much more scalable and fast-growing manner. Um, so the essential uh, solution is fraud prevention and online banking, as Greg mentioned. Um, we solve a really massive and growing and vexing issue. Um, internet banking's been around for a long time. It's evolved quite a bit. Uh, there's a new generation of internet banking that's upon us with um, mobile banking, with all sorts of different payment mechanisms being integrated into the online banking system. Um, and one of the things that doesn't get talked about much is that fraud has grown and almost outpaced the innovation in online banking itself. And the protections that have been in place to date have not really 
been effective to stop online fraud. It keeps getting bigger, more money gets stolen, the criminals are more emboldened than ever, and there's very little repercussion for um, a criminal that gets caught. Uh, they're, they're ten, they tend to be overseas, there's not much jurisdiction that can affect them, they just move on to the next victim. And the traditional techniques of either trying to protect your computer or your mobile device with antivirus protection or anti-malware protection have failed. Um, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a, a finger in the dike against a tsunami that's, that's hitting them with, with malware propagation. And authentication techniques that are really an attempt to put a really strong lock on the door. Um, any of the most sophisticated multi-factor authentication techniques have also failed because they make the assumption that um, once somebody successfully logs in and passes whatever test you give them, then you can trust them. And the fact is that all of the malware that's loaded on all these machines and mobile devices is designed to defeat authentication. And once it's defeated and the criminal's in, they can do all sorts of things to steal money and extract uh, value out of the financial system. So we take a radically different approach to the problem. We assume that the endpoint's compromised and that authentication's defeated. And we use all of the digital information that a user creates when they interact with the online banking system to create a very specific individualized behavioral profile of that user. And from that, we can, we can actually very precisely and very accurately detect when somebody's logging in who's not a legitimate user. And we, uh, we're now deployed at about 45 banks um, and credit unions throughout the country using the system. We're targeting the sort of long tail of the banking industry. There's about 17,000 financial institutions that are our target market in the U.S. And um, uh, that's, that's the kind of essential solution. Great. So, so what I'd love to do is to, uh, is to uh, frame a little bit how I think about entrepreneurial companies and what I look for and what's interesting to me. But I don't actually want the whole discussion to be about uh, about fundraising and about venture capital because a big part of, of that story is really about identifying good businesses and good people. And so, you know, to me, the, the kernels in there that are interesting is uh, focusing on partly uh, how I'm evaluating, you know, what are great people and, you know, great CEOs and, and entrepreneurs so that you can chart your course uh, in, in an appropriate way and partly what are, uh, what are really good businesses. And I think in both cases, there are some interesting anecdotes about transitioning the business to be a better business. And, and, and that's, what I, that's what I'm most interested in. But there, there is a little bit of, um, of, of, of framework over that and we'll sort of bounce back and forth with, a, I think, a couple of these vectors. Uh, the, uh, so, I'm at Sutter Hill Ventures. We've been in, in the venture capital business in Silicon Valley for 48 years. Uh, you know, by virtue of doing that, I think uh, we are not uh, and don't try to specifically be uh, sector specialists in the sense that I'm a SaaS guy or I'm a consumer internet guy or the like. I think of my mandate is basically anything that touches software and comes from software and, and the like you know, you have to evolve with the times and, uh, and you ultimately do that by figuring out, one, how to be in business with great people, and two, how to get into really good businesses. And the, the way that I like to say that, some of my partners will say, so we're microeconomic, meaning, you know, not thematic, right? You, you think about, uh, you know, there are firms that are SaaS-only firms or that are consumer internet only firms. Just like you look at the marketing of mutual funds and some will say, hey, well, we're the science and technology fund. Well, we, we want to be as the really good business with really great leaders fund. And you do that by looking, from my perspective, the company is the unit of analysis, not the sector. Right? So I don't come in and say, man, I really got to be in the people search business. I'm going to go interview six companies in the people search business. I'm going to figure out which of those is the best because I've already determined that it's a sector that I, that I, that I want to that I want to be in. There are people who do it. It's not what I do. You try to initiate that conversation in my partnership, you get thrown out of the room. And so, you know, people would say, find me a company, you know, let's talk about a company, right? You, I mean, you can go meet with six companies, talk about one that you think is a good example. It's a little bit like thinking of it as the case study method of, you know, of, of studying here at the 
at, at, at the GSB, and that, but that those basically do come down to you know fundamental economics of the business. Do you, do you know, do you, are you in a growing sector? Is there an incumbent leader that you're displacing, or are you evangelizing a new market? Do you have unique and proprietary technology? Are there business advantages that you can build over time? And uh, you know th that you either have or, or are pretty clear that you can build over time, and uh, and then you know the fundamental framework for evaluating that is you know is 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 risk and reward, and so uh, you know you look at you know lots of people come and say hey well I'm building this marketplace, and you know once I have the buyers and sellers, I'll have this great defensible advantage, but of course barriers to entry before you have them are barriers to entry for you too, right? So, you know, one of my partners always says, well, that, you know, that's great. That's a, that's a ham and eggs business model. If I had ham and if I had eggs, I'd have ham and eggs. But you start out with neither and it really doesn't do you a whole, a, a whole lot of good. Uh, the, uh, you know, the people side of it is, um, you know, it's really very, uh, you know, it's very nuanced, right? We're all just making our own judgments and our, and our own assessments for, uh, you know, some things that are general and some things that are specific to the opportunity. And I think uh, the right place to start w when I think about it is, uh, is that in my partnership, the single greatest compliment that you can give someone is that they're intellectually honest. You know, and, 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 and both of these guys met that test. The, the question is, are you evaluating data and are you living by the data and are you learning every day and if something, if you have a strategy and it isn't working, are you unafraid to call it and to change? And it, you know, if somebody can do that, that's the, that's the fundamental process. And the, uh, uh, another way of saying it is that um, start, starting a company is a great truth-telling device, right? The, you know, the market doesn't lie. And if it doesn't like what you're doing, you gotta do something different. Uh, and, and there are, you know, there are plenty of people out there who uh, either only want to hear good news, who only want to raise the next round so that they can keep running the company. And, uh, and so I think that's just the, you know, the, the, you know, the basic piece. It's also the case that um, leadership matters, right? You, you know, you see it in, in all kinds of circumstances, but, but ultimately entrepreneurial companies should not succeed. And the only way that they succeed is by small bands of great people taking on giants and accomplishing things that shouldn't be able to be done. And in order to do that, you have to galvanize resources that you don't deserve. Right? Better quality people then you know, ought to be drawn into these small companies, more capital and resources uh, than, uh, than uh, you know, what a traditional financial investor would be willing to, uh, to provide uh, partners and distribution channels where people are taking big bets on you that that, that they shouldn't and uh, it, it, in some logical construct and so I think that notion that says intellectual honesty uh, leadership to galvanize and draw those kind of resources uh, enough uh, self-confidence and humility to be willing to consistently hire people who uh, who are better than you are in a specific domain and, and, uh, and then there are some really complicated pieces about how do you hire someone in a domain that you don't know that well. And the, the easy way to say that, I think, is for a lot of people coming out of business school, hiring a, frankly, you know, hiring a CEO, hiring a VP of marketing, uh, hiring a product manager is a relatively straightforward thing to do. Hiring a VP of engineering when you're not an engineer, now that's hard, right? Hiring a VP of sales, actually, when you don't have sales experience yourself, really hard, because salespeople know how to sell. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it's really hard. And to me, those are the, the, the two biggest challenges. And most people, if they're going to become CEOs at some point, have to go from being really knowledgeable in a function to being a general manager managing functions where they don't know as much as the people that they're hiring and, and are working for. And that, and so that judgment that says, boy, is this someone who can figure that out, who, who knows what they know, knows what they don't know, is learning quickly enough the stuff that they don't know, 
and uh, you know, and that to me is um, is the is sort of the central framework. So, uh, you know, I think with that, I'd I'd actually like to turn to 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 Matthew, and I'll I'll give a little bit about uh, about what I saw in the business when I saw him, and then but but then ask him to tell the story of the beginning and the evolution of that business. So uh, first, I'll say uh, I was totally impressed with Matthew the minute I met him. And you know, as you can see, these two guys are different ages. They've got different backgrounds. I'm it's younger. <laughs> you got a full head of hair. You know, you'd be grateful for that. <laughs> the uh, and and so it's not that um, that you know what I actually try and look through someone's age or exact experience or the like, and I'm and, and I'm trying to infer qualities and, and, and capabilities. And I think the, the, uh, um, the, some of the things that I referenced are, were just you know, crystal clear in, in Matthew, right? Dedication to the company and to the task, uh, commitment to being fact-driven, running more experiments and learning faster, including failing faster than anybody else, uh, had already demonstrated, it, you know, in spite of being a relatively young uh, CEO that he'd been able to hire people more experienced in certain disciplines and uh, and be able to to attract talent because I think that's always one of the challenges for a relatively relatively young CEO and an incredible sense of um, of uh, self knowledge and humility and willingness to, to to learn from all places right not not uh, that I or the other investors are. Um, you know, our pontificating from on high were one, one input among many. And he's out talking to business partners and talking to other CEOs and just learning and, and, and picking it up. So if there ever a time where you said, this is a guy who is great and getting better every day, you know, this, this is the guy. The other thing that I think is interesting uh, and that points out just a little bit about uh, the, the venture process is that um, there were a couple of... Uh, things that gave me a little bit of insight into the business, right? So one of which is I'd just done a big genealogy project. And so I had some personal knowledge of the space. The second is that I'd done a bunch of work in monetization and uh, lead generation and ad targeting. And while they're using it, that technology stack for a very different purpose, it was a technology stack that I was relatively familiar with. So I think for anybody that you're trying to pitch the business to, they're having one or two of those access points that take things that might feel a little mysterious and make them really easily understandable is a, is, is, is a big difference. So that, that was my orientation coming into the business. Now Matthew can tell you how the business started and, you know, and actually you know, grew to that point in some of the decisions they made along the way. Cool. Thank you for the kind words. Um, <clears throat> so when we started the business, we had about 75 to 100 grand in seed capital from the proceeds of the last business. So that's some of the context on self-funding it. Um, but we were able to do that and self-fund that business from there um, over the few years. One of the key things that I went into Silicon Valley, I moved out here uh, in early 2007. Um, I had a very strong skepticism of VCs. And I actually would encourage you all to have a strong skepticism of VCs, except for Greg. No. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, I think that you, know, you hear a lot of horror stories. You hear a lot of stories of entrepreneurs saying, hey, you know, don't raise money if you don't have to or I got booted from my company or something like that. And so I came in with my guards up. I, I was very fearful of even going down that path or that process. And, um, and we had a business model where if you could figure out how to make a dollar ten for every dollar that you invested in promoting the, the products, that, that you could scale it relatively well. Um, and I also had the distinct advantage that I had a co-founder who, between us, we knew how to kind of build the sites, put the e-commerce engine together, and do the marketing without needing too much other talent. Um, although, you know, engineering talent was the first, the first folks to hire. So I would echo from an entrepreneur perspective what Greg's saying about um, the people um, mattering the most. I think it's mattered the most to us in terms of the team that we brought on board. And then it's been a huge factor in consideration in terms of how we selected the VCs, um, Greg, and then also Josh from uh, Matrix Partners. And, um, 
And so my, my personal philosophy is just kind of copy what other people have figured out. So on the hiring front, we do smart and gets things done. Those are kind of the two criteria uh, in terms of how we think about position. Um, part of getting things done means that they fit in culturally. And so, um, you know, no, no asshole rule. Um, we want to make sure that people are, um, you know, going to fit into the company and, and, and do well. But that formula, Google's repeated it. There's been uh, a lot of engineering blogs that have, that have talked about that, smart and get things done. And then on the partner side, which we would consider um, our investors to be partners, um, it's Warren Buffett's model, which is people that you know, people that you like, and people that you trust. And I just think that that's the best wisdom I've been able to find on how to select partners, is you gotta get to know them, you gotta like them, and Greg's a very likable guy, and, um, and you have to trust them. And I think integrity was, it was always really critical to us in terms of selecting an investment partner, partly because we were um, a little bit skeptic of bringing on money, skeptical of bringing on money um, as entrepreneurs. So how we went down the process was we basically um, friended a uh, venture capitalist. Actually, back up, back up uh, about two years, because I think, sure. you know, to me, part of the interesting thing that I want these guys to hear is, how did you go for three years without raising any money, yeah. right? Because I think that's, a, that's actually a, a big part of it, too. So in, in 2007, um, the gentleman that had purchased our uh, prior business, he was in North Carolina. He made an introduction to uh, his roommate back from uh, Harvard Business School. And one of the recurring themes, I didn't go to business school, I actually dropped out of undergrad. Um, but one of the things that has happened since I've been kind of trying to scale the organization and everything else is those of you who are in business school, the connections that you guys are getting cannot be underestimated. Do not underestimate them. Hugely important in so many ways. Can't, can't reinforce that enough. Be but, nice to everybody. <laughs> and, and, and part of what, part of what <laughs> on that front, j just side tangent here, but um, when, if you're not an engineer and you need to hire an engineer, or if you're not a uh, salesperson you need to hire a VP of sales, I think part of the way to solve that is through weak ties. And there's been a lot of studies that, you know, the more weak ties that you have, um, the more, more successful you will become. And I think having a lot of weak ties of people in diverse interest groups, which is a great, you know, business school is a great breeding ground for that in many ways in terms of the university environment. You could build a lot of those weak ties and you never know when those phone calls or then those contacts are gonna be useful. But, but that aside, uh, the first thing I did when we started the business was I had a mentor that had kind of introduced me to email marketing or to internet marketing uh, long ago. And then uh, the gentleman who had bought our prior business, we brought them in as advisors. And they had some stock in the company, but they didn't have any board seats. We didn't have a board. There was none of that. But they kind of serviced uh, us as kind of a functional board, if you will, because we didn't have a formal kind of people who were giving us feedback and supervising us as the entrepreneurs and as the co-founders. And that worked extremely well. Um, I think that you know, getting advisors, people you trust, whether it's a professor, whether it's a friend, whoever, but getting people that uh, you respect and feel are knowledgeable in certain areas to advise you on the business um, is really important. And they introduced us to a gentleman by the name of Jason Green, um, who is a venture capitalist over at Emergence Capital. And, and Jason and Rick, one of our advisors, had been roommates. Jason, we purely met from a, uh, hey, this is an entrepreneur, hey, this is a guy I trust, you guys should get to know each other because you're new to the Bay Area. And what Jason did was he invited me to one of the VC events that Emergence Capital puts on where, you know, you have this big atrium and all these people, you know, cocktails and food and so forth. And it was there that we met our first executive. And so this was the path that we took, but basically it was there that I met a gentleman by the name of John Spottiswood who would run Match.com um, from 97 to 2000. He had a very illustrious career in, in internet, had helped a few companies go public. And we basically maintained very low salaries um, for the first, I think, nine months, we didn't even really make anything. And then after that, it was like $30,000 a year. We were putting all of the money into executive hiring. And John was one of the first executives that we brought on board. It also brought another executive uh, who, who was named Donald Landworth. And those guys made a humongous impact on our business because what they did is they took a lot of the business development, they took a lot of the operations completely out of our mind share, our being Brian and I, um, out of our mind share that we should focus on the products and the marketing. So for us, getting the products and the marketing nailed 
really is all that mattered. And I think one of the most important lessons that I've learned um, in terms of that experience is anything you can do to reduce your plate and, and continue to focus on the few things that you really have to get done for everything else to develop, um, take advantage of those opportunities and, uh, and don't underestimate them. Try not to do everything. As an entrepreneur, you want to do everything. Try not to do everything. Try to make sure that you're nailing the really important stuff. The, you know, and if I draw that theme from a couple of other uh, examples that I've seen, and the thing that I think uh, Matthew and Brian did so well is think of themselves out of the gate as founder and VP of X, right? So, so there isn't, you know, the, the way that entrepreneurial companies succeed and especially are, uh, are really don't require a ton of capital is, is one as much probably more focused on getting stuff done than, than on being smart. And even when there's a team of founders, everybody, there is no room for overhead, right? So the, the uh, uh, you know, picking out those two most important things and say they're too important for to, to be done by anybody but the founder. So I can think of another example, Merced Systems, where I'm involved and basically says one, one of them, I said, I got product, the other said, I got sales. And it turned out he'd never really sold anything before. But he, but he was really, really good at it. And for the, for the first two years, they just did it, right? He did the first 10 sales by himself. And I think that notion, so you, 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 you want to be focused enough so that you develop the functional expertise, you hire around it, mm -hmm. but you, got, you, you, you just got to get in and do it and get, you know, and, and get stuff done. And these guys have done an exceptional job, I think, of doing that. Yeah, so how we got to the capital part and um, to close the loop and say a few nice things about VCs because I started on the negative side. Um, what we did is we actually found that, hey, this introduction from Jason resulted in executive hire. We need more help hiring. We need more help understanding the business. And so we started developing relationships with a lot of different venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. And I would say that uh, venture capitalists are kind of like the nodes of activity that are happening in a lot of the different industries and companies. They have amazing visibility into what are the decisions getting made at the leadership level, what are the board meetings looking like, and so forth. And so as an entrepreneur, you can consume a lot of information that's really valuable, all entirely for free, over lunches, coffees, drinks, whatever, with a, a, a wide variety of folks. And most venture capitalists, when approached, will definitely sit down and meet with you. And so the, the key thing on developing relationships on that front that I learned was make sure that um, you are receptive to advice and you're going with kind of not a full cup. You're making sure that the cup's a little bit half, half full or, or three quarters full so that they can give you some, some framework, some tips and so forth. And then don't come back to them until you've implemented to some degree what they told you to implement. I think it's very easy to say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea, but you know, it's not what we're doing or something like that. And it's disrespectful to then ask for help again and ask for help again if you're not actually implementing. And so what I try to do is just kind of keep track of what people are advising us to do. And if, they, you know, if it makes sense for us to try and so forth, we'll do it. And then we say, hey, here's what we did. Um, and th it's a formula that worked really well for us. So after a while, I had gotten to understand more of the VC process still, you know, 100 hour weeks into the business and just putting the sweat equity in, bootstrapping it. And then we decided that we needed, for the business reason, to be better capitalized. And a lot of what drove that decision was our ambition. We were uh, seeing success in the marketplace, but we had multiple verticals and therefore we had multiple competitors and we didn't want to have too small of a balance sheet to go after. And so we decided to go through a formal process of picking seven or eight uh, VCs that we enjoyed uh, meeting, that we knew, and, and that we had some degree of an early relationship with, and we went through the process. Um, and I don't know if you want me to go through the nuances of that, but what ultimately resulted was uh, choosing uh, among a few term sheets, Greg and Josh, to be our partners and to raise that capital. And by that time, there was a long relationship, and they met all the tests of no like, and trust. They understood our business, and we were able to do a deal that we felt was win-win on both sides. I mean, the thing that I think is symmetrical in that is that longitudinal data really helps about people, right? So they'd gotten to know us over a period of time. I think, you know, you'd actually known the Matrix guys for longer, right? But, but that does really help. And, and so in, in the same way, I think just developing those relationships uh, will give you confidence that you're working with high-quality people, but it will also give 
other people confidence as they say, oh, well, we talked about this last time. You told me you were going to, so the way I think about it is, you told me you were going to do X. You know, you came back, did you do X? Or do you have a good reason why you decided X wasn't the thing to do, Y was, right? The, um, the one nuance I'll put on Matthew's point is, I mean, I just always want entrepreneurs and CEOs to, 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 to make the decision. This is not the case necessarily with all board members or all venture firms, but I'm perfectly happy to be an idea machine. But the last thing I want you to do is to go implement everything that I say, because that's a recipe for disaster, right? I mean, ultimately, the guy working 100 hour weeks knows more about the business than anybody else in the world, right? And has got to take all that data and be the place where it gets synthesized and things are prioritized and makes the call about what to do and what not to do. And I'd much rather have that conversation about what are the three things you're going to do, what are the 10 things you're not going to do. Right. And they can change from time to time because I assume that you're out there learning and getting smarter every day. And, and the, the things that we really enjoyed about Greg and Josh, and I, I continue to have a philosophy around, is that venture capitalists who have been in your shoes are better than venture capitalists who haven't. And so people who have been in operating roles at companies uh, or have started companies, they just they understand and speak a language that's easier for an entrepreneur to get really insightful advice about the operations of the business on. And, uh, and that's, been, that's been extremely helpful. And the other, the other piece that's been extremely helpful for having these guys on is continuing to get introductions to people to scale the team. So as you think about the value add of venture capitalists, it's expensive money in a traditional sense. You want to mainly do it when it's the right time for the business, but they will introduce you to a lot of people or have those connections available if you want to take advantage of those introductions. In our case, we did, and that's been a, a huge source of referrals in terms of people joining our company. Right. I mean, my, my philosophy is that basically the, there are four rules of venture capital. Once you're an existing investor, the first is physician do no harm, right? If you don't, you know, don't, don't try to run the company, don't meddle where you don't have information, make sure that the CEO is running the company. The ultimate responsibility of the board is hiring and firing CEOs. Uh, and then there are three places where I think you can be generally useful. One of which is uh, str strategic guidance and pattern matching. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sitting on 10 boards, you know, I probably sat on another 10 or 12 o over the history of time. You just see a lot. Uh, it is a job where you're a, a bit, you know, uh, a mile wide and an inch deep. You know, if you're really good, you're two inches deep rather than one. Uh, but, but I think that does allow you some pattern matching. And the second is uh, you're, you know, you're a business development arm of the company. And the third is you're a recruiting arm of the company. And those are the three places where you can really help. So the four rules are don't hurt and help in those three places, and, and you're doing your job. Uh, so I want to flip over to Terry uh, for a second because I think the, you know, this is a bit of a you know, of a different story, right? And on some level, you'd say, well, Terry is a, you know, professional CEO, had been a CEO before, had been a COO before that, uh, you know, in, in, in very successful company. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, but I think also came in and told a story that just, uh, because a presentation is just telling a story, right? You're telling it in 20 PowerPoint slides, but you're just telling a story. And, and just, you know, so this happened for me probably, I don't know, 18, 15, 16, 18 months ago. And it just, like, it just all clicked. You know, so, you know, 45 minutes of presentation and all those pieces work. Now, we just went, uh, Terry just got uh, successfully raised uh, a follow-on round of venture capital uh, with a friend and regular co-investor of, of mine. And uh, another good guy who, you know, again, people matter, right? My co-investors, they matter a lot. Right, and so, uh, but I think it'd be interesting for Terry to talk uh, a bit about how we frame that. We actually loaded up his his presentation on the on the uh, on the computer here, not for him to flip through the whole thing, but I think there are some key slides that are, you know, potentially good examples to say, you know, your company is different, but you have to have one that looks like this that solves this this problem. So I don't know if you want to. Talk a little bit more about yeah, fundraising little, process first. Let me give you a little context uh, on, on the company, what stages it went through when Greg invested. Um, I'd probably add a fifth to your uh, list of things mm -hmm. to help with, and that is fundraising in the next round, yeah. targeting, yeah. focusing, uh, finding the right fit, because um, there are a lot of VCs out there and being able to 
you know, I'm not an expert in who the VCs are and what they focus on, but Greg is and was able to really get us very focused in this, in this round. Um, we've raised uh, $27 million to date. Uh, we just raised 11 of it. We announced it this week. We raised it a couple, couple weeks ago. Um, that's essentially our Series C. Greg invested in our, in our Series B, essentially Series B, which is a hard round to invest in um, because you have to have, you kind of have to have a shared vision with the investor about where the market's going. There's not enough. The way I'd characterize it is, in some ways, A's a little easier because it's all promise. If you believe the idea's big and the market's big and the people are smart, it's all promise. You don't have any reality to bet on yet, so you're betting on the dream. Um, B, you have some reality, and it's not all good. Um, you know, the company had a product that worked, that solved a problem. We had six or seven customers, but hadn't added customers very quickly. We didn't have a lot of repeatability. Um, you know, so Greg had to believe in enough of the vision of what we could do with the proof points that we had, and had to believe in the team and um, you know, that we'd be able to execute on the fundamental things that we needed to change to make the business really, really turn um, and, and sort of have the patience to, to see that through with you. So you know, we found that in Greg and, and in Sutter Hill. And, and, it's been, and actually, can I, can I make a, a couple yeah. of uh, uh, additional observations, right? Because this is, again, sort of my framework as an outsider coming into the business and what made that work. Because there's one other thing about the company, right, which is it went through its you know, Series A, but, uh, but over two and a half or three years, I mean, all with Foundation Capital, who's a you know, good firm as the, as the investor, right? But kind of two and a half or three years and you know, eight or nine or $10 million. Like it, it spent some time looking for its, for its future, trying to get product market fit. And the, I actually, uh, uh, you know, me, I'm always trying to say, when you walk in the door, do you have product market fit? Is, is the fundamental question, and not has it been a completely linear path. There are a lot of people who wouldn't want to look at something that's been around for three years and is just getting there. That doesn't bother me at all, right? And, uh, but then to this same point, you say, well, how do you, what are the access points that made it easy to make a couple of those bets? So, you know, the first is, uh, Terry, right? So the fact that the story was so clear and crisp and well articulated, and that when you periodically drill down into something, he had good thoughtful answers. Even if I didn't agree with them necessarily, they were thoughtful and well thought out, and there was a rationale behind them. And the, uh, and you know that really matters. Uh, the place where it's hardest to do that, honestly, is uh, is in the financial model because it's all assumptions and who the hell knows, right? But even the notion that says, hey, look, you've been clear about who your customer segment is, which features they need, how you're pricing, what's path to market, and then it's all lined up and strategically consistent, right? Basic stuff, but it, a lot of times it doesn't show up. But the, the, you know, the other thing about Terry is we have a very close mutual friend, right? A, a good personal friend of mine who had uh, worked closely with Terry in the last company. And I'm telling you, it's an example of the, you know, it, of the weak ties just makes a difference. Because I can call up one guy and say, just tell me the truth, right? And, and, and so that makes a big difference. The second is that this whole predictive analytics technology stack, which nobody else is using in online banking fraud prevention, but lots of people are using in mo you know, internet monetization and ad targeting and the like. So I was very familiar with the technology stack, even though it had been, was being applied in a totally different place, and I had, experts that I could bring in to say, you know, can you help me come kick, kick, kick the tires? And if it's a completely different technology stack where I don't know the experts, it's just that much harder to get my arms around. And the third is the target customer segment. My sister runs one of these banks, right? And so, I mean, I've, I, I grew up knowing, right. you know, for most people you say, oh, well, I'm selling to community banks. And they're like, well, I, I don't, you know, I do business with Wells Fargo or BFA, I don't know any of those, right? I, you know, I'm not used to selling to them. Venture back companies aren't usually selling to them. And, and I, you know, so again, I come back to that notion of these little access points demystify. So when you're looking for, you know, an investor, it sometimes is worthwhile. And, for, and from the, uh, the entrepreneur side going through that, um, you know, we talked to a few firms to raise Series B, and Series B was hard to raise because we had been around for a few years. And, 
you know, we had um, some reality, but not a ton of proof on where we were trying to take the company. And, um, you know, the, there were some VCs who went through really deep diligence with us, painful, excruciating diligence. And, you know, if you had, I, I didn't necessarily feel like I had a lot of choices at the time, but if I did feel like I had a lot of choices, the fact that they were taking me through such excruciating detailed diligence would have been a sign that we're probably not aligned. Uh, Greg did diligence, it wasn't painful. He asked for information, but he had a lot of touch points already, and he had a lot of confidence in the technology stack and the market and the, and the viability of it, and he wanted to vet the things that he should vet, but it wasn't, um, so you didn't feel like you were re-explaining the rationale behind the business every time you interacted with them, which was, in some cases, you know, that's a sign. If you keep explaining the same thing to your potential investor and they keep asking the same questions over and over, that's not alignment. You know, that's not good alignment. It, they may think it's a great idea and want to invest and want to believe, but it's, you really need, uh, I think everybody said it, but cultural fit, chemistry, and alignment are probably the most important thing in, in getting this to work because you're going to work together through thick and thin. And your business plan is not going to be what happens. Your business plan is a spreadsheet and a set of projections based on your best information right now. And things are going to change, and you have to know why. You have to be thoughtful about why. You have to be thoughtful about what to do next when things do change. And, you know, you can come in under your plan, and you can come in over your plan. But I guarantee you, um, you're not going to come in exactly at the plan you put down when you go talk to an investor about funding the business. Um, and we've, we've done both. We've done both together. And the reaction and the reason that you know, when you know you have alignment is when, you know, the, the quarterly results didn't come out the way you expected and you're lower. And the reaction is, well, let's understand the fundamentals. What's going on? What's your assessment of, of why? And are the basic premises about how we're building the business, that the customers are still buying it, that um, the market is still receptive, that your product plan is still tracking, are those st all still in place? Okay, let's go forward. And in fact, uh, you know, I can remember one quarterly meeting after Greg had invested where the management team was so sort of distressed at not having made their numbers that Greg and the other investors were actually being the cheerleaders in the board meeting, explaining to our management team why, hey, everything you're doing is pushing the rock up the hill and things are going to get better because you're executing on all the fundamentals that we all believe in. So it wasn't about this kind of maniacal focus on why did you miss this number, why didn't you get this deal closed. It was on the fundamentals and, and the metrics of the business. And that, that's real alignment. That's real sort of alignment on why you're doing it. And I, you know, I think it's been a great, a great partnership from that standpoint. Um, series uh, C, essentially, which is what we just raised, is a different round. Um, a lot, you know, we were able to, with our Series B money, execute a lot of things that we wanted to execute. We were able to transition the business to a SaaS model. We were able to restructure our pricing and our go-to-market approach. We were able to develop some channel partnerships that are starting to pay off. And we were able to get a level of repeatability into the sales model that, you know, it's still not going to be perfect and it's not going to trend exactly how we think. But we were able to confidently say, look, we've got a couple of quarters under our belt where we said we were going to sign this many customers. We did. Uh, we're deploying them quickly. We've transitioned to the SaaS model. It's working. So we've got a lot of vectors that are working. Still a lot of uncertainties, but it's more, you know, I think of Series C as you've hit a, a pace where you're repeatable and somewhat predictable, and you want to pour some fuel on the fire and grow on that predictability and repeatability. So the, actually, one of the things that I that I want to do in, in two different ways is, with these two different companies is actually pull on this thread of what I'll call, uh, you know, transitioning the business and, you know, when you decide to do it and how you do it and what are the risks in doing it. And I think in the inflection case, it's launching new product categories, right? And so I think the, the um, one of the guys who I have a tremendous respect for is uh, Ben Horowitz, who's Mark Andreessen's partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Ben and I were product managers together at, at, at Netscape and I, and uh, earlier in my career, and he was one of those guys that I look at and I say, oh, he's doing the j same job I am, but he's just much better at it. <laughs> and, uh, and I think as, uh, but, you know, to me, I interestingly, uh, I would say that is, that, you know, that's how you learn, 
right? I mean, babies learn because they mimic the adults and the older kids in their environment. And I think, you know, the, the, the life lesson is you surround yourself with great people and you learn what they're doing and, and mimic it. And I have this theory coming out of business school that I've just learned by running my own experiments and, and learning faster. It turns out that that's a much slower way to learn. And it's a lot easier just go to great companies with great people and learn from what they do. You'll make plenty of your own uh, uh, mistakes along the way. But uh, you know, one of the things Ben said when he was running Opsware is uh, basically launching a new product. Version 1.0 of a product is the single hardest thing we do. You know, I have many product managers or engineering leads who can do version 2 and 3 and 4 when there's a bunch of data and there are customers to talk to. Version 1.0 is brutal. And there are only four or five people in the company that I trust to, to do that, who've got enough intuition about product market fit. And if I don't have one of those people available, I won't let a project start. I'll either not do it or I'll buy it. And so I think, you know, if you maybe want to talk about launching, you know, big new products, because I think that is part of what opened up the business, <clears throat> opened up the, uh, you know, available market for the company and put it on a bigger stage. Yeah. How, how many... Um people here are interested in launching a consumer facing type of product just so I can get a sense of it's a consumer internet this is the most so b2b no okay um, so for us I mean launching a product is really tough the the number one lesson set of lessons I got was by doing it to feed myself uh, when I was in college I had no money I was working uh, six bucks an hour at some work study program was going to school and I was trying to uh, figure out how to sell ebooks to high school students on how to get into college and so I was writing sales letters and creating marketing material and then trying to convince people to do it and doing it over the phone and that actually was the best single learning experience because when you're when you're at that stage you you quickly get the lessons it's, it's much better than than reading it out of some book but um, you know, taking it up a level. I think that you want to be data driven. You want to be quantitative. Greg talked about that. It's one of our core values at our company. We're constantly looking for folks who are analytical and who are thinking uh, what we call it, not intellectual honesty. We call it thinking clearly at inflection. Um, were they a clear thinker is one of our benchmarked um, kind of questions on interviews. And so you want to be listening to the data because we all have ideas. Ideas are a dime a dozen, and we all can have intuition about what's going to work. But at the end of the day, users will surprise you no matter what. And so I think listening to that data. And what we've created is um, it's still you know, continuing to morph and form in, in inflection, but we've created essentially a loop where you have kind of a product manager, someone who's the quarterback of the product that you're going to launch or the feature. It could be either. And then you have engineering, who's going to build it. You have design, who's going to design it and, and preferably do wireframes, mockups, everything else. And then you have an analyst who's going to continue to research the data, understand what it's saying, and report back. And that feedback loop with some QA involved and um, a few other functions um, is, is really kind of the magic formula for us. We've launched a ton of websites and features and products at Inflection. And what we've tried to do is along the way, look at the patterns for us of what are emerging and then put those into the platform so that we can continue to be faster at launching things. Um, I will say that the most successful launches we've done have always been, um, you know, the, the three weeks before that, no one slept hardly at all. Everyone was up all hours of the night. Um, there are always millions of more details to make these things work than you ever expect going in. Um, there is no replacement for just hard work, rolling up your sleeves and getting it done. And I think that you need to be working with people that, you know, you can go to war with in that regard. Um, I remember, uh, you know, myself and one engineer uh, being at the office at all hours of the night one time when we were launching a website and just looking over and thinking, like, if I just didn't inherently trust this person, if I wasn't, if we weren't both totally on the same page, this would have never worked. We could have never gotten this this far. And companies are so bureaucratic once they start growing just by nature of adding a lot of people to the company that I definitely um, would never underestimate the value of, you know, whoever you're working on with that initial product launch. You just got to make sure you guys are on the same page and the same wavelength. So, so archives.com, I mean, you know, basically uh, 
has has become you know half the business or something, right? And you know it was a you know it's a two year old product, right? So it was launched two years into into the history. Was it one you know one more website among uh, among many that you've launched when uh, you d you guys decided to do it, or was it a uh, did you know it was a big deal and you know therefore was launched with more forethought? Um, yeah, I mean it's a combination of all things, but. You know, just the metaphors we use, you know, throw the spaghetti against the wall, see if it sticks. We use an agile development cycle. And so oftentimes we're throwing things against the wall. And if they start gaining traction, we add more resources to it. If they, if they really look exciting or promising, then we really dig in. We may throw away everything that we've already done to date because we think it's such an opportunity that we need to build it, you know, in a more substantial way. Um, but one of the things that uh, an entrepreneur friend of mine told me that, that's really stuck with me is don't weight opportunities equally. You'll see so many opportunities in your business for improvement, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that some opportunities are, you know, 50 times more important than others. You know, hiring a really phenomenal VP of engineering versus, you know, fixing the code on that, on that one site uh, or, or optimizing the checkout process, something like that. They just can't be weighted equally. They can't make it to your to-do list equally. They can't consume your mind share equally. So for us, we saw that, hey, there's this baby boomer demographic uh, shift that's happening in the United States. We're acquiring all this historical data that it doesn't look like a lot of people are actually acquiring and organizing. And um, everything from census records to newspapers to obituaries to death records internationally. And we see that people online are very interested in genealogy. Meanwhile, the leading company in the space, Ancestry.com, has a product that's over $200 a year, which doesn't really appeal to a beginning person who's interested in their family history. Um, their S1 provided a wealth of data, including the fact that 15% of folks um, in the United States express an interest in family history. So that's kind of interesting. And we started putting all these pieces together and said, you know what, this makes sense. So the first site we launched was called genealogyarchives.com. And it was doing amazingly well right from the get-go. And it had a lot of headroom. And so uh, we went out and found the person that owned archives.com. They weren't using it. We made a big bet um, because we didn't have VC money and that was an expensive acquisition. But we'd made a big bet from retained earnings Put the, put the bet on the table, and we're now the number two family history website. Our product's 40 bucks a year for unlimited access. Um, we're, we're growing very rapidly in that category, and, it, and it's got a lot of headroom ahead. So um, I think that's kind of the story of how we did it. You know, I think from there, I would just love to maybe ask you know, Q&A when we get to yeah. Q&A of, of what other nuances that can go into. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I think is interesting about consumer internet products is there's so much feedback and there's so much data. And uh, so, you know, product management, the product market fit piece is always some part analytical and some part, some part creative. And the creative part is what do you put out there to test, right? So you know, if, you, if you don't have some bit of that creative instinct or judgment about what people might want, then you can put a bunch of things out and they'll all fail. Yeah. If you can get the right kind of people to, to make those judgments, you hopefully often the, the founder, right? One of the founders. Uh, then you can start analyzing data and, and figure that out. You know, I think the other half of the, of the uh, transformation piece, and this is one of the bets I was willing to make at, a, at Guardian that I think some, maybe some other people weren't, and that has gone exceptionally well, but is really, really hard, is in, 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 um, in service of trying to create a better business, is the, this transformation to, to SaaS. So from a excuse me, enterprise software that a customer deploys in their own environment on their own hardware yep. to, to a SaaS-based solution. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about uh, both uh, what that was like to, to actually do, but then also how transformative it's been to the, to the business model. Yeah, it's been huge. And it, you know, and, it, and it wasn't a technology decision. It was a strategy decision, and it was a market decision to begin with. Um, and I'll give you a little of that context. We start, the company started out, like most security companies in the financial services space, saying we've got to get Bank of America and Citibank and Wells Fargo, and you know, that's going to validate the product and put us on the map. And they tried that. We tried it for a couple of years before I got there, but we tried it for a couple of years. Um, the, I think the biggest banks we succeeded getting were like Zion's, pretty good sized bank, First Republic, um, Silicon Valley Bank. You know, some decent sized banks, but not the really big guys. 
Um, and then we were starting to have some success with smaller banks, regional community banks. Um, but we were this on-prem model, and we, uh, and, you know, you had to deploy it, yet they had to buy a server, they had to start an IT project, we had to go on site, we had to stand up the system, we had to integrate to all the different possible databases and operating systems that big IT shops have. Um, we inevitably, with bigger banks, ran into the, well, let's just tweak this, customize that, fit it into our environment in this way. So every job was kind of this big, massive effort to get it working. And we looked at the market and said, well, look, there's 17,000 or so banks in the U.S. 30 of them are really big and look like Bank of America and Wells Fargo, and the other 16,000 uh, 970 don't. And most of those guys actually buy their online banking system from one of about 10 providers. There's Intuit, there's Fiserv, there's Fidelity, there's Jack Henry, and a handful of others. So the market's actually consolidated around these internet banking platforms, and these banks buy outsourced services because they buy their internet banking platform from a essentially SaaS provider. I don't think they called it SaaS when they first introduced those things. But, um, and they buy solutions. They don't want to buy something and rip it apart and reconfigure it to fit into their custom environment. Um, and they make decisions. And, oh, by the way, they're also completely underprotected from fraud. And the fraudsters have figured it out and have started attacking them. So the problems really migrated from the big banks down to these small guys. So we said, that's the market we should go after. That's really who's going to buy our product. But to do it, we have to have a SaaS solution. Um, for all the kind of cost and complexity issues, but also that's the thing that this market's going to buy. So we decided to, to make that transition. It was not an easy decision to make. We put a lot of thought into it, and we had to raise money in the midst of that and say, well, we've decided this for these reasons, and we know we can execute and make this transition to SaaS. And that's kind of a scary prospect because companies try to make the transition from on-prem to SaaS, and it's not, e not always easy. Um, we were lucky in a couple ways. One, we didn't have to change our business model. We charged a subscription for our software from the beginning. So even though it was deployed on-prem, we didn't have to change the way people paid for it. Um, and two, we knew that this was going to be hard, so we anticipated it. We hired a, a really extraordinary net ops person who I'd happened to know through previous companies. Um, he worked with me at Good Technology and his boss worked with me at Good Technology and at, at uh, uh, Market Live. Um, so I knew him. He had a pedigree, and I knew he could set it up, and he could do it, and he was willing to really put the effort in to do it from scratch. Um, and we knew we're dealing with personally identifiable information about account holders in banks in our hosting center, and we're a venture-backed startup. Um, so we knew security might come up in the conversations. So. Um, you know, we anticipated that from the get-go, and um, we went and talked to these banking platform providers and to our existing customers and said, give us your security audits. If we came to you with a hosted solution, what's the security audit you would put us through? And we got a half a dozen of these security audits. And we also got an outside uh, consulting firm that does security audits for a living for banks. And we designed our SaaS solution based on those security audits. So we're SAS 70, level 2 compliant, and all those things. But we also have a dozen security audit checklists from real banks in our file drawer that we checked off as we were designing and building the SAS solution. So when we migrated and we've gone out and we started selling, and they said, well, how do you pass the security audit? And they pull out theirs. We've got that's part of the Venn diagram. We've already solved for all those things. And we haven't had a single issue. We haven't not gotten a deal. Uh, a single deal because of security concerns, which is one of the, the things that kept me up at night for nine months while we made the transition to SaaS. So it was, it was very successful. And by the time we actually turned the switch on the, on the SaaS solution, it was just this, last, um, this past August, um, I think we had 17 customers on-prem, and all but three have said definitively that they're going to migrate to the SaaS solution. So, that's pretty good, and we've added 25 or so new customers to the SaaS solution. So, since then. so talk about things like you know deployment time frame, time frames to value, yeah. you know yeah. sales cycles and the like. Because I think this is part of the benefit of the SaaS business yeah. model, and it just has been proven out in space. 
Well, it's massive. Um, deployments uh, for our on-prem customers took four to five months. The actual work was less, but the elapsed time to get them to set up the IT environment, secure the servers, get everything set up, they had to launch an IT project. And then we had to do a bunch of on-premise stuff. It took four or five months. Um, we're doing deployments on platforms that we know in two to three days now, literally from months to days. Um, the 17 customers we had were all on a different version of the code on-prem. We, uh, all of our SaaS customers are on exactly the same code base and we do a weekly release. We do a weekly bug fix and feature update release. Every week, every Thursday there's a release meeting. We push a, a, a new stack of code out every Friday. Every customer is on the same code base. And in fraud prevention, that's a big deal because the criminals are changing all the time. And we have a customer right now that we're trying to save who's still on-prem who's on like four revs back because they haven't gone through the hassle of updating and they've said, you know, you're not stopping all the fraud. We're like, well, 4.2 does. That exact fraud case we stopped last week at another bank on 4.2, but you're on 3.0. We can't protect you with today's fraud with yesterday's code stack. So having the SaaS solution has been kind of revolutionary. And then just the, you know, there's, there's an upfront fixed cost but every incremental customer that we add to the SaaS solution, um, the marginal cost of that customer is very, very small. So we can grow to a couple hundred customers without really adding any significant fixed cost to the business. Um, and it becomes a very, very capital efficient model. So thanks for your time and attention and you know, we'll hang around if you have more questions uh, after the panel.